Hi, Dr. Cubit. How are you tonight? I'm great, Katie. Um, hello, everybody who's here to join us. Dr. Cubit and I are really excited tonight. We're going to be talking about um, our horse's digestive system. And this, I think, is going to be a really great discussion tonight because when you really think about it, this is kind of what makes the horse tick. Uh, you know, making sure that everything is working properly in their digestive system to hopefully alleviate some issues coming down the road or anything like that. Um, so I think it'll be good. Let's see, whoever is on currently, if you guys wouldn't mind letting us know where you are coming in from tonight, where are you viewing from, what state? Um, Dr. Cubit, you are in Virginia. I am, and, and I'm it's starting to be spring. Is it? That's nice. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in Idaho, and it's still snowing. It's no, snowing yeah. on my drive-in tonight, so, um, yep, we are, uh, we are still facing winter, but, um, let's see, I, I wanted to let everybody know that, um, we're going to be giving away some free product coupons, um, for a few different individuals that are joining us on the live tonight, so, I, um, if you could share on Facebook or Instagram or wherever you're viewing from, share this face, share this live right now on your feed. Make sure it's public. If you're on Instagram, go ahead and tag us on Instagram. We'd love to be able to choose somebody from that. And then we're going to have a short survey at the end that will basically allow us to get some feedback from you guys to see what you liked, what you didn't like. And, um, it gives us uh, just an opportunity to make these better for you. So we're going to um, select a winner from the survey as well. And then just for being on with us tonight and engaging and having a great conversation with us. So make sure you stay on to the end so we can make sure that um, you guys have an opportunity to win some free product coupons. Uh, let's see. Debbie so is far, here. Yeah. Debbie from New Jersey. She's most likely getting the rain that we're getting here in Virginia. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Excellent. Okay. All right. I um, wanted to talk a little bit about uh, our Beyond the Barn podcast. I don't know if those that are on with us tonight have listened to it yet or not. Dr. Cubit and I actually are the co-hosts of the Beyond the Barn podcast. We talk a lot about horse nutrition, but then we also um, talk about um, we have some guests that join us that kind of just live the lifestyle that we do, right? So they, um, might be well, more well-known, but they have a really cool, inspiring story. And we'd love to be able to have different, um, people on to join us for those things. We also have some other livestock species on occasionally as well. We did just release one on sheep and goats. So if you like sheep and goats, that would be a good one to listen to. Um, episode 76. Um, our next one is actually going to be releasing this Tuesday, and I'm very excited about this episode. It is going to be with Jody Morton of Green, Gold, and Blues, and she is from Australia, and she has ridden the Bicentennial National Trail. I think it's just called the National Trail now in Australia, and then also the Continental Divide, and in the name of mental health. And so she's going from rural community to rural community just to kind of just open up the conversation, kind of break that stigma surrounding mental health. Um, she's an amazing person, amazing individual. She's gone through a lot, um, and she shares a little bit of what she's gone through and super inspiring. So make sure that you guys tune in on Tuesday when her episode drops. That'll be episode number 77. And um, if you guys have topic ideas or anything like that, we welcome you to give us some feedback. Uh, podcast at stanley.com. We'd love to hear from you guys and see what you guys are interested in learning more about and what you want to hear about. So who has been on one of our live events before? And then also, if you could let us know where, what, what social platform you're tuning in from. Um, <clears throat> okay. 
and I know we're having a little issue with connecting our Facebook. And so um, if, um, let's see, YouTube, awesome. We have some people on from YouTube, which is fantastic. This is our first time doing it on YouTube. So hopefully you guys enjoy it. Hopefully you like it. Um, let's see. I will just give a little bit of background about myself. Um, I grew up in Central Oregon and went to North Idaho to the University of Idaho and um, got degrees in ag business and animal science production. And I um, worked for the Cattlemen's in Oregon for a little while and ended up in Idaho uh, working for Stanley on a lot of their nutrition content, educational content for consumers and everything. And so it's been a lot of fun doing that. Dr. Cubit, can you share a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. So I am originally from Australia. I grew up in rural Australia and went to undergrad, did animal science undergrad at the University of Queensland. And then I was fortunate to be awarded a scholarship to move to the United States. And I was able to study um, equine nutrition at Virginia Tech. I did a master's and PhD. Now I work with a company called Performance Horse Nutrition, and we uh, work with lots of different companies around the globe. Stanley Premium Western Forage is our uh, hay forage company that we work with. Uh, and we provide uh, nutritional counseling, help with product development, help with education like this. So I'm excited to be here tonight. Yeah. Um, so as we kind of get started, uh, I wanted to start off with a few questions, Dr. Cubit, just to kind of um, prep this topic. Sure. We're going to be talking about the horse's digestive system. So before we can really even begin to talk about it, I mean, you talk about this all the time where it's really important for us to determine what is normal. So then we know when something is abnormal. So can you kind of walk us through what looks normal for a horse's digestive system, um, how it's working properly? Sure. And, you, you know, the question was, what is a, how does a normal digestive system work? And I think all digestive systems are the same. It's more about the management that can change um, and alter a horse and, and how effective their digestive system is. But ultimately, <clears throat> there are major components to the equine digestive system. The first being the teeth and the teeth, you can see my hands and a horse. Oh, where's that? chomp, 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 chomp like that. Um, that's how we chew, but the horse gr grinds, their bottom jaw works in a circular motion and actually grinds that uh, hay and pasture and grain that you feed them. And then it's mixed with saliva and that's called mastication. And then they swallow it down the esophagus into the stomach, which is very small in the horse, unlike the cow where the stomach is the four chambered with the rumen and <clears throat> abomasum. The horse has a very small stomach with two regions. Um, the bottom part has some acid in it that is continually secreted and that continues to break down food. Then we flow into the small intestine and the small intestine is where we have enzymatic digestion that's going to break down your sugars and starches and we're going to get some absorption of vitamins and minerals. And then in the hindgut, which is after the small intestine, it's made up of the cecum, large colon and small colon. That's where all the fermentation occurs. So it's like the, you know, the rumen of the cow, but it's in the hindgut of the horse in the back end. So <clears throat> a millions and trillions of different types of microorganisms live there. Collectively, we call that the microbiome. We have to keep that healthy. <clears throat> the microbiome itself function functions as another organ and controls a lot of different processes in the horse. It actually directly communicates with the brain and the brain communicates with that microbiome, that grouping of organisms. So <clears throat> when we think about hay or pasture, the primary part of the horse's diet, that's all getting digested by the microbiome in the hindgut of the horse. So that is how it's supposed to function. All those pieces are the same in every horse. It just depends on what are you expecting your horse to do? What are you feeding your horse and other management? Like, is it a senior horse? Can it actually chew long stem hay? Things like that. Yes, excellent. 
And I know that we probably have some people jumping on uh, from Facebook now, so we welcome you. And um, go ahead and throw in the chat where you guys are tuning in from. Um, we're so glad to hear, have you here with us tonight. And as you kind of pop that up, um, we will also, Dr. Cubit, kind of speaking of how the digestive system is supposed to work properly, can you talk to us a little bit about, um, some people question, like, should I feed my grain first? Should I feed my hay first? Does it matter what order we feed? Um, yes and no. I mean, if there's nothing wrong with your horse and they don't guts their food and you don't feed a lot of concentrate, let's use the word concentrate, anything that comes in a bag, which is concentrated nutrients, because we know that some of those bags don't actually have any cereal grains in them, um, then no. I mean, whatever's practical for you to do. But if you have a horse that might suffer from some digestive issues, um, eats their food fast, their concentrate fast or has gastric ulcers or has a tendency to colic or choke, then I would definitely recommend feeding the hay first. It will slow them down. It will increase saliva production. It will buffer that stomach acid. Um, so it really depends on the animal. Perfect world. If somebody said to me, which one should I feed first? I can do whatever you tell me to do. I would say feed your hay first. Um, but if that isn't practical, then whatever works. Excellent. Thank you. And since we have some new folks on, I would actually also like to let you guys know that as usual, we're giving away some free product coupons tonight to a few different individuals. So if you're joining us from Facebook, please go ahead right now and share this Facebook live on your page. Make sure it's public so we can see Share that right now and you will be entered to win um, some free product for a chance to win some free product coupons from Stanley. So do that now so others can see that we're live and going. And um, I see that we have some individuals. Um, we've got a couple from Ohio, Dr. Cubit, Idaho, Florida. All over now. It's flooding in. Yep. Colorado. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So great to have you all with us. Michigan. Excellent. Thank you so much. And um, another thing that I was hoping that you could talk to us a little bit about, Dr. Cubit, is um, how can, if we have a horse that may, might struggle with leaky gut, first of all, how can we tell if that might be what the issue is for our horse? And then what ways can we support or help them? Well, let's roll back and say, what is leaky gut to start with? So, <clears throat> and we've got the camera on so I can use my hands. But if you think about that hind gut we were talking about, the large colon, the small colon, there are cells that line that large intestinal wall. And I think of them like my hands, right? I can even put it that way, where the palm of my hand is the cell that lines the wall of the intestine and my fingers are what we call villi and they increase surface area so to increase absorption but between those cells that section there there are these things so where my my hands meet together there are these things called tight junctions and really they're just like velcros and they're meant to stay nice and tight and when food is absorbed is actually absorbed into that villi and then through the through the cell it's not meant to go between the cells here so those cells are supposed to stay nice and tight together unfortunately what's happens when horses are stressed now it could be change in weather that's going to happen right now. We're all in a period where we're going to get some warm days and it's going to flip back to some cold days. We're going to get fake spring and then winter is going to come back. Um, so the weather, rapid changes in weather uh, can be change in diet. It can be a long trailer ride. It can be heavy exercise. That's the other thing we see this time of year. The weather's getting nicer. We jump on our horse, go for a long ride. Um, and he comes back and he's real stiff and sore. So there's so many things that can stress a horse, but we do know that when you stress them, those Velcros, those tight junctions between the cells can fail. 
and it's just like a Velcro on a shoe that is slowly breaking down and it doesn't hold it together anymore. And so what we end up having is in the actual digestive system, we have non-digested food particles and toxic materials that are fine. They usually just flow out the other end of the horse into the manure pile. But unfortunately, in these horses where we have that breakdown in those tight junctions and we have this crack between these cells, we have contents that's meant to just flow through the digestive system and out now flowing into the bloodstream. That's why we call it leaky gut because literally gut contents is leaking into the bloodstream. <clears throat> Some classic signs that you might say, oh, I think my horse might have leaky gut. Um, chronic diarrhea that you just cannot seem to get under control. Now, I'm not talking about fecal water syndrome where we have formed fecal balls and water. I'm talking about chronic loose manure diarrhea. Um, uh, can change in behavior. Maybe we do all of the therapies for gastric ulcers and it doesn't work. Um, their behavior still stays pretty bad. Uh, the other one is allergy-like symptoms. So if your horse gets hives, uh, bumps, you do an allergy panel, you get your vet out, they take some blood work and do an allergy panel and you get it back and it lights up like a Christmas tree. Like your horse is allergic to everything and you have no idea what you're gonna feed it. Chances are it's actually not allergic to any of those things. It's allergic to life itself right now because it's got all this junk flowing through the bloodstream, which is going through its whole body and it's just got this chronic inflammation through its whole system and it's literally fighting itself. So they are some symptoms of leaky gut. Yeah, and um, it, it's a tough one. And um, so if, if we have anybody on that's listening tonight, maybe they're like, oh, this is my horse. Like, I haven't been able to figure out what's going on with them, but I feel like these are some of the things that I'm seeing happen with them. You know, obviously we need to make sure that we're working with our veterinarian with any of this kind of stuff. But can you share with us a little bit about if we are able to determine this with our veterinarian, um, what are some ways, I guess, from a nutrition standpoint that we can actually support or help our horse with this? So worst case scenario with this, if we get down the path, one of the other things that the horse will do is they're so uncomfortable and in so much pain. And, you know, what I didn't mention, well, I kind of mentioned the stomach is really small. We've all had a horse or know of a horse that's had a gastric ulcer and how much it changed their behavior. And the stomach is tiny and those little ulcers are tiny, but it completely changes the horse's behavior. Now we have the hind gut, which is ginormous compared to the stomach. And if that tissue is damaged, they'll get quite depressed, uncomfortable, um, and they, they may even just completely go off their food. So the first thing I want to do is stimulate appetite again. So I usually take away everything and I start back with a mixture of forages um, and usually pelleted forage as well. Yes, long stems hay is the most ideal, but it can be a little abrasive. Um, so anything that I can get a lot of water into, I can soak. So maybe I'll do a little mixture of beet pulp and alfalfa, um, Timothy, and I'll mix that all together in small quantities. Because also when a horse goes off their food and you try to get them to eat again, and all you want to do is put food in front of them and get them to eat, especially if they've lost some weight. Um, any of you that have had a, a child, it's kind of like feeding a toddler. If you put a bunch of food in front of a little kid, they're going to freak out and say, I can't eat all that. And they're just going to walk away. But if you give them one carrot at a time, you turn around, they've eaten a whole carrot or a whole pizza, whatever you're giving them. So I also think it's a bit of a mental game. I do small amounts so that they're constantly grazing and they're not overwhelmed. Um, and then my philosophy is understanding the horse's natural defense mechanisms. So we know that there are things that the horse already naturally produce that helps protect itself. So in the stomach, for example, there are cells that secrete mucus. So that bottom part of the stomach where the acid is secreted, there's mucus produced down there so that acid doesn't become detrimental. We also know based on our management that we can um, kind of wear away at that mucus coating, do a bunch of things. So my, my philosophy with the stomach is, well, let's feed things 
to the horse that are going to not replace or add uh, kind of artificial mucus, but what stimulates the horse to make more mucus. So, right, it's working within the system that the already, horse already has to protect itself. We know that in the hindgut, one of the bugs that lives in the hindgut creates a volatile fatty acid when they ferment and break down fiber. One of the volatile fatty acids, which is a metabolite that these bugs create when they break down fiber, is called but butyric acid, right? And butyric acid's only role is to feed those intestinal cells and heal those intestinal cells, so those busted Velcros. <clears throat> so that is the horse's natural defense mechanism, already can heal itself. We also know that when a horse gets stressed, one of the first microorganisms to start to die off is the microorganism that creates butyric acid. So what we can do is then, okay, we can add sources of butyric acid knowing the gut isn't producing it right now. We can feed a lot of fiber so we can try and get those bugs to come back, that variety of fiber. But in the meantime, we can also add something like butyric acid into the diet to give some instantaneous healing properties, um, re relief and support feeding those intestinal cells. So um, I try to work within the natural defense mechanisms that the horse already has. Excellent. And one of, um, you're talking about butyric acid. So that's actually an ingredient that is in one of the new products that Stanley has, uh, has released mm -hmm. and the gastric support. Um, right. so, and with that, I'm curious, some of the other ingredients that are included in that, um, what other ways could that support, like if you're talking about gastric ulcers, mm -hmm. um, what are the other things that are in there that actually, I mean, we're hitting multiple nails on the head with this one. Sure. Yeah, that product was really developed uh, gastric to support. And, and typically when we think about gastric, we automatically talk about gastric ulcers and stomach, but it's head to tail, right? We're talking yeah. about stomach and hindgut. So for the stomach ulcers, we have uh, a marine derived calcium that's going to help give uh, buffering, instantaneous buffering to that stomach acid so that it's not wearing away that mucus as quickly. Um, we've got the butapearl ZEQ, which is the butyric acid encapsulated in zinc. We also know that zinc is a powerful immune booster and 70% of your immune system is, is in your gut. But we also have pre and probiotics. So again, if we go back to the microbiome and that horse protecting itself, how the horse keeps itself healthy is by having a wide variety of different microorganisms living in the hindgut. If it's alive, we call it a probiotic, okay? So probiotics are live microorganisms. So we can then, we can feed those to the horse and they're gonna arrive alive and they're going to increase the numbers of live microorganisms that live in the hindgut. And research has uh, evolved over the, over the years. And so we know now which bugs we're trying to put in there. We're not just blanket putting a bunch of random bugs in there. We're putting the bugs in that we know the correct probiotics that we know are uh, suppressed when we have gastric upset. Also, you can't just put probiotics in there. If the horse has gone off its food and you put bugs in the gut, bugs eat fiber. So if the horse isn't eating fiber, then those bugs are just going to die. So anytime you're feeding probiotics, you want to also make sure you're feeding a prebiotic. Prebiotic is simply the food that the bug eats, right? So if we're adding a certain type of probiotic, we want to make sure that we're adding a prebiotic that is going to complement that. And so this has got a complementary, we actually call it, call it a symbiotic when you add the uh, prebiotic and probiotic that work together, okay. it's in this product as well. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you for breaking down the prebiotic and probiotic because no I problem. don't know that people always understand the differences between the two and how they kind of work together. So that was, that was awesome. And 
I invite you all um, that are on, please start putting in your questions. Um, if you feel like we skipped yours and we have some coming in, go ahead and put it in again. But um, we're going to start going through now that we've kind of started off this discussion tonight. We want to invite you guys to ask some questions that you might have um, about your own situations or, you know, along the lines of what Dr. Cubit has already been talking about. One of the questions that did come through, and I think it was when you were discussing the leaky gut, Dr. Cubit, was Amber was wondering if it can cause a horse to have muscle soreness throughout the whole body. Um, indirectly, I'm sure I could make an argument, but muscle soreness throughout the whole body isn't a direct symptom of leaky gut, no. Okay, excellent. Indirectly, I could say, okay, if you've got whole body inflammation, then it's certainly not helping. But I wouldn't say if your horse has got muscle soreness, that would not be the jump that I made. I would be looking more at like tying up, for example. Okay, excellent. And Elaine was wondering, she says, I'm using the gastric support about three pounds. Does it have to be wet? I do some wet and some not. Here's what I say. If your horse likes wet food or tolerates wet food and you are in a situation where wetting the food is not a huge pain, like you don't live in Wisconsin in the middle of winter, then I love to wet everything. Getting more hydration into the horse's gut, especially when we're trying to overcome an issue, is only beneficial. Um, if it's absolutely not practical, don't worry about it. The other thing is if your horse hasn't eaten pellets before or is a, an aggressive eater, anytime you feed pellets, then I would wet them just so that we can slow down that rate of intake or um, kind of what happens when a horse eats really aggressively or really quickly is they don't chew it enough. So they don't mix enough saliva in and that can increase the risk for choke. So we're overcoming that by adding water and we're kind of artificially putting the saliva in. So if your horse has never eaten pellets before, then I recommend you do try and wet it. Um, but if your horse, if this is what you've been doing, three pounds, some wet, some not, and your horses are, you know, easygoing, slow eaters, never had an issue before, then what you're doing is is perfect. But uh, I do, I, I would recommend that when you first start feeding something like this, that you, you do wet it. Right. And there was, let's see, Julie has a little bit of a long one. Whenever I feed my young mare any grain or feed with sugar, she becomes crazy and acts like a hyperactive child on sugar, rearing, biting, kicking, bucking. She becomes dangerous to be around. She is now fed hay only. But I'd like to know why this happens when other horses safely eat the concentrates. Is there a test, a known condition? According to her DNA testing, she's a six panel negative. Negative? Yeah. Okay. So she doesn't have any metabolic disorders. but Here's what I say. Horses are like people. Some kids can have the red food coloring and be totally fine. And other kids look at the red food coloring and are bouncing off the wall and are completely insane. So, um, you know, if she is the type of horse that just does not digest and tolerate high sugar diets, then the only thing I would add is a ration balancer or some kind of vitamin and mineral supplement to her hay. And if that is working well for her, then go with it. Don't fight it and don't try and feed her a cereal grain concentrate if it doesn't work well for her. And trying to answer why it doesn't work for her and it works for another, um, I mean, there could be a million and one different reasons I don't think we'll ever really tease it out. Right. And every horse is different. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. Tabs says, what would be good for a senior horse? Okay, Tabs. Great question. Um, very common question, to be honest, about feeding senior horses. And the first question I ask is, it actually isn't anything about age. It's what are your horse's teeth like? It might be a 15-year-old horse that has terrible teeth. It might be a 30-year-old horse who has great teeth which one is truly a senior, the 15 year old with terrible teeth. It all comes down to, can your horse still chew long stem hay and maintain their body weight? If they cannot, doesn't matter what the age they are, then we really need to look at processed forage products, pelleted, cubed, even chopped, um, so that they can consume, actually get it into their mouth, that fiber 
uh, component of their diet, which is one and a half to two and a half percent of their diet needs to come from fiber. If they can't chew it, then we need to provide it in a form that is actually going to bite, get past the, the teeth, down the esophagus and into the digestive system. So for a senior horse, if your horse has got great teeth, it could be a ration balancer and good quality hay. If they're starting, if their teeth are starting to fail, then maybe we replace some of that long stem hay. Uh, well, maybe first you go with a better nutritional value hay, and then maybe you go to some chopped hay. And once chopped hay becomes uh, uh, unchewable, then you go with a cube and a pellet. So you kind of go all the way down. Excellent. And Natalie had a comment. I think that was in reference to what Julie said. Um, try Stanley Premium Western Forge Smart Carb Performance. I use it on my horse that doesn't do well on sugar. Um, and that has the um, alfalfa and teff in mm -hmm. it, which are, it, I mean, and I guess that depends, <clears throat> like, on if, if hay doesn't seem to be an issue for that horse, then it may not, you know, be a problem. But I guess if you're looking to get even lower sugars, um, maybe that um, could be an option. Yeah, you know, the Smart Cub is another new product that we've come out with. And anything that comes in a bag by law needs to have a guaranteed analysis on it. So that's one of the benefits to buying a bagged forage product. Now, whilst I don't, I, I try my best not to have horses eating 100% pelleted forage. We've just talked about a senior horse that maybe has no teeth, then that's an, a, an area. The other thing is, if you have a horse that is very sensitive to sugars and starches and you can't test every batch of hay that comes in from your local grower, then that's another way, uh, re area where I might say, okay, let's bring in a low carb forage pellet, the smart carb. It's got, you know, flax and it's got yeast. It's got some higher fat content for uh, weight maintenance, but also very low in sugars and starches. Uh, I think the sugar is, I'm, I'm reading here, starch, 2%, sugar, 6%, fructans, one and a half. So very low on the sugar and starch um, uh, front utilizing very digestible fiber sources, the alpha, alpha, teff, beet pulp. Um. Excellent. Um, we actually, I'm not going to pop this one up just because we don't have the ability to share it, but we do have a question that came in from Instagram that I want to share with you, Dr. Cubit. Sure. And um, the Keep the Faith Farm on Instagram is dealing with uh, IR in a 15-year-old paint pony, not obese. Yeah. Uh, I can't get mixed cubes consistently. So is my best option Teff and Timothy pellets? Yeah. So insulin resistance in a pony that is not overweight. So we're trying to keep the sugars and starches low, but we're also trying to um, maintain body weight or even increase body weight. So I actually would go with an alfalfa pellet in this case, because alfalfa is always lower in sugars and starches than your grass haze, but it also gives you good quality protein and extra calories to maintain body weight. Once you get to a point where you're at the body weight that you need, then yes, teff is a perfect option. Um, teff is much lower in sugar. It's low in sugars and starches, just like the alfalfa, but it's much lower in calories and protein as well. So first thing I ask with an insulin resistant horse or a horse with metabolic issues is, is the horse fat or thin? And that's going to kind of dictate the direction that we take. Yes. Excellent. And Jessica says, I have a 28 year old PPID horse that has very few teeth. I give him some hay, but his diet is mostly alfalfa pellets and wet grain. He is doing well, but would alfalfa Timothy pellets be better for him than just the straight alfalfa pellets? Um, as far as calories, there, there's multiple answers here. As far as calories, the alfalfa pellets are going to give you the most calories compared to an alfalfa Timothy. The Timothy will decrease the calorie content. If we take another stance and say, well, you know, I think he's got loose manure. I'm worried that the hindgut um, may be failing a little bit. Then by adding an alfalfa Timothy, we're adding a different fiber type, right? So we're increasing diversity in the hindgut. So you have to kind of pick the thing that you want to address first. If it's weight gain, 
straight up alfalfa. Go with alfalfa every time. If weight get, if weight is okay, and we think mm, loose manure want to boost hindgut function a little bit, then yes, alfalfa Timothy, because we're doing something different here. We're still providing some calories, but we're also increasing the amount of fiber types, increasing diversity of bugs in the gut. Those are some great considerations. Um, and just a quick reminder, um, if we haven't answered your question and it seems like we haven't gotten to it, feel free to throw it in again. Sometimes when we're going through these lives, it's easy to lose some of them. So don't be afraid to put your question back in there for us. Um, Chris says, um, what is a ration balancer? Uh, great question, Chris. So a ration balancer really is exactly what the name of it. it it's like an adjective, it describes the product. <clears throat> it balances a ration. So whether that ration is right now 100% forage, a ration balancer is a very concentrated, so usually it's one or two pounds a day, and it's primarily vitamins and minerals and a little bit of protein, all right? And so it's a concentrated source of nutrition that is going to balance the ration. Could be that the ration right now is all hay and forage, or it could be that you're doing cereal grains. Maybe you're feeding straight oats or rolled oats, crimped oats, and you still, there's no fortification, there's no vitamins and minerals. You need to balance the ration. You know, there are also a lot of people that will buy the black bag that's got the pretty jumping horse on it. My trainer feeds it, but if I fed the recommended feeding rate, um, that my horse would be really fat, so I feed one or two pounds a day of it. You can use a ration balancer with, you know, consult with whoever your nutritionist is or your feed rep um, to also balance that ration if you're not feeding according to the feeding directions on your kind of performance feed. But it just balances a ration with vitamins and minerals. Excellent. And so I recognize her because I couldn't pronounce her name last time. I think it's Sarah Anna. Because you want to go with Sarah, but it's Serrano. Serrano. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My almost 28-year-old mare will get diarrhea slash fecal water syndrome. It's more diarrhea, but she doesn't act ill unless she gets a half cup of alfalfa pellets daily when there's no pasture. She is PPID, but well controlled. Is this a symptom of leaky gut? So... Uh, if you go water center, so she doesn't do it when she gets the alfalfa. Or it sounds she does like it's better. It. Like yeah, yeah. It sounds like it's better if she gets I'm the alfalfa pellets. Sure. You know, if it's better when she gets the alfalfa, like I could speculate at a few different reasons why, but I would just say keep doing it. That's great. Um, you know, maybe there's some carryover from the stomach. Maybe she's got a little bit of um, gastric ulcers that the alfalfa is kind of stemming that and she's feeling better um the diarrhea could certainly be a symptom of leaky gut but if she doesn't really have any other symptoms it could just be an unbalance in in the gut in hind gut too at 28 we do know one of the symptoms one of the things that research shows us with the microbiome is that with age no disease state just age the microbial diversity starts to decrease. And then, you know, that that in itself can just increase um, diarrhea. So if yeah. half a cup of alfalfa helps her, great. Help her out, yeah. And this is one of those situations where it almost would probably take some really good, like one-on-one -on -one work time with yeah. veterinarian, nutritionist, kind of team up there and start going through, right? But how you sometimes guys work through you could go down a rabbit hole and if it's working, just go with it, right? Yeah. Why? Yeah who knows go with it <laughs> that's excellent okay what food sources are best to build up probiotics Whoo! big question okay great question though valerie um if we want to naturally increase the the variety of microorganisms living in the hindgut then it's feeding a wide variety of different fiber types straight up so you know it's feeding um, meadow grasses, super fibers like soy hulls, beet pulp, alfalfa, timothy, all the different types of fiber types um, will help build up that microorganisms in the hindgut. There are prebiotics that you can feed that are natural feed ingredients like beet pulp, 
Bee pulp is con considered a prebiotic. It is a superfiber. Soy hulls, these things we know are uh, rapidly digested by good bugs in the hindgut. So. Excellent. Okay, Sammy wants to know, how long do you have to be on the gastric pellets for the horse to get the full effect? Oh, well, um, we know that the intestinal cells in that line the, the gut, it's like a 14 day, I think I'm remembering, a 14 day turnover that they are going to um, actually regenerate. So I, I usually recommend 30 days for anything that you're trying, but we should start to see some changes in about 14 days. Excellent. Okay. And Debbie Wont says, I'm dealing with Cushing. Cushing's and IR horses. Will the gastric support help with that? And also you have on other podcasts recommended oil and teff pellets dealing with the weight loss also. Okay. So, so if we're dealing with listener. Yes. Great. Thanks, Love it, Debbie. Um, if we're dealing with weight loss, so this is one of those, I ask immediately fat or thin, and I'm going to say thin. So we're going to go down this route. Um, this isn't one where I would feed Teff. I would use the smart carb because it's got higher fat in it. Uh, like we're looking at, I think it's six. Let me look here. I got to make it wider. Um, so we've got some flaxseed. We've got some stabilized rice bran. We're looking at 8% fat in the smart carb, actually. So low carb, but higher fat. Um, and, and so using oil is also giving you calories without any sugars and starches. So with the Cushing's or IR horse that needs to gain weight, yes, the gastric product, the gastric support, but I would probably lean more towards the smart carb performance product, a higher fat content, um, whilst always also being really low in carbs. Excellent. And we have just a few minutes left. Um, throw in any questions that you have and we'll try to get to at least two more if we can. Um, and then we'll have an opportunity that you can come join us in our Facebook group if you didn't have a chance to get your question answered. Um, if you can right now and have not, go ahead and share this um, on your Facebook page, uh, share the live so people can jump on the end of this and um, have the opportunity to hear some, some comments from Dr. Cubit. Um, and if you're on Instagram, go ahead and share it and tag us so we can see it there. But as we get through our last couple questions from Carrie, Carrie says, is it better to keep horses on free choice hay or to stop them at two to 2.5% of body weight? Oh, another great question, Carrie. And again, it depends on the horse. Is the horse a real easy keeper, maintains weight well, or gets fat easily? If, if that's the case and they're a real easy keeper and get fat easily, then yeah, max them out at two, two and a half percent of body weight. Um, if you're trying to lose some weight, then we can back that down to say one and a half to two and a half percent of body weight. If you have a horse that is hard to maintain weight, then let them eat as much as they want. They're really not going to eat more than three to three and a half percent of their body weight. They just not have enough gut capacity. Right. Okay. We have another one coming in from Instagram, Dr. Cubit. Mary wants to know, she says, my horse has stomach issues every change of seasons. Mm -hmm. What can I use for this diarrhea issue? Uh, yeah, and it's being pro proactive. That's a situation where you know when the weather's going to change. Um, you know, oftentimes in the spring, we see diarrhea. In the fall, we can see some impaction issues. And it's all about water. And so if it's transient, don't worry about it too much. In the springtime, we see a lot of horses get diarrhea because they've been used to eating hay, which is very, very dry. And then they start to graze on pasture, which is 80, 90% moisture, especially that spring grass. And so the gut is just adapting to that change in moisture content. So if it's transient and it goes away, don't worry about it. In the fall, it's the opposite. They're used to eating some wet grass and now we take them off the grass and we feed them hay. And so the gut can actually dry out. We can see some impaction issues. If it continues, then yeah. Or you feel like, well, every season it comes and then it stays way longer than it should, then you might want to be pre proactive with a probiotic or pre and probiotic, something even like the gastric care um, to help with that transition. Excellent. 
And Tina says, why choose cube over pellets? Have a 33-year-old Arabian with no teeth. Uh, it really, wow. Yeah, 33. I mean, that's fantastic that you get to 33. That's really good. Um, ideally, long stem hay. And then because it, they, it takes the longest to chew, uh, mental health, gut health, long stem hay is the best. But you've got a 33-year-old horse that has no teeth. So the, the first step away from long stem hay is chopped hay for me. And then the next step is cubed. And if you look at it, it's just we're decreasing the fiber length slightly each time. So, to, so that it's still something manageable. But at 33 with no teeth, a cube may still be uh, not available. You know, they can't chew that. So we may be at pellets by this point. Um, so that's why, that's why I would make the decision of pellets over cubes in your horse's case is the cube just may not be chewable. Excellent. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, if you have some questions that we didn't have a chance to get answered tonight, we really want to invite you to come and join us in our Facebook group. And we'll go ahead and link that in the comments, the, the life we live, ride, and love. And um, let's see, let me find that. Jazz says, what is the best forage to feed to a horse with M-Y-H-M slash I-M-M? I have no idea what that acronym stands for. Okay. <laughs> if I, you tell me what it is, then we yes, can go. Comment through. to us really quickly. Throw Send that in a there. comment, Jazz. <laughs> you stumped me. Okay. Um, as we're waiting for Jazz to, Google. to reach back out, <laughs> I want to remind you guys, uh, some of you weren't on when I mentioned it before, but on Tuesday, the Beyond the Barn podcast is releasing a new episode, episode 77 okay. with Jody Morton, who is a, known on Facebook and Instagram, well known as Green, <laughs> Gold, and Blues. That is just the colors, Green, Gold, and Blues fantastic individual. She's riding, you know, it's almost like extreme trail riding is what I would call it, but she does some really cool rides in, in the name of mental health and trying to break down that, that stigma, that negative stigma that kind of comes with mental health. And so please go check her out on Facebook and Instagram. Um, before that podcast release, but you're definitely going to want to go subscribe. Um, so you can listen to that episode. Uh, let's okay, see. I know the answer now. I know. Got it. Okay. So, you know, the research in these uh, kind of tying up, uh, rhabdomyolysis, PSSM, um, these tying up disorders is, is rapidly advancing. And MYHM is myosin heavy chain myopathy. Um, and the IMM that she mentions there is immune-mediated my myositosis. So oftentimes I talk about exertional rhabdomyolysis. So exercise-induced tying up. These are non-exertional rhabdomyolysis. So exercise isn't stimulating this to happen. This is a genetic condition um, in co primarily quarter horse breeds and some others. But again, like all the actual chemical pathways and biochemistry that's going on might be slightly different within all of these tying up disorders, whether it's PSSM, you know, EPSM, type one, type two, these disorders that you've uh, mentioned here, but ultimately they do not deal with sugars and starches. So we need to keep them on a low carb diet. So the smart carb, the TEF, the alfalfa, these are all ideal for horses with those muscle disorders. Excellent. Thank you. And Jess, thanks for your question. Uh, let's see. Okay. We are at the end of our time tonight, but um, we have some winners to announce. So don't jump off just yet. We want to see if you won or not. We will also be selecting another winner next week. So um, we have a survey that we're going to link in our comments on um, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. So please be sure to click on that survey link. Give us your feedback. Let us know 
what you enjoyed about this live, what you thought maybe we could do better, what you want to hear about next time that we do a live. Um, the more information that you give us, uh, the better we can do for you guys in serving you and your needs and basically allowing you to uh, take care of your animals better and feel better about giving them what they need. So please fill out that survey before um, you wrap things up tonight. Um, also, join our group, The Life That We Live, Ride, and Love. Um, we'd love to have you guys in our community to be able to talk about some of these um, questions that you might have come up. Dr. Cubit um, is a great resource for you to be able to, to look to and ask these kind of questions. Um, and I think that's all that we have. Um, we will have this available on YouTube. You guys can go back and watch it if there's anything that you want to reference. Or if maybe you want to share it with some friends and be like, hey, Dr. Cubit talked about this question. I think you're really going to want to know the answer to it. So you can share it with your friends, go back and listen to it later, but it's going to be on YouTube for you to check out later. And our winners, I actually have really good news. So normally we do three winners, um, but since we were also on YouTube and Instagram tonight, we're going to add in two more winners. So you guys are lucky tonight. Um, so the winners that we have, um, Mary from joining us on Instagram. Thank you, Mary Ro Robustelli. Sorry if I'm mis mispronouncing that, but Mary, if you could email us at podcast at stanley.com. We'll put that email in the comments so it's easy for you to find. Email us so we can um, get your contact information and get those out to you. Um, Chris Siemens on YouTube. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been so fantastic having you all on with us. Amber Peterson, Facebook. Thank you, Amber, for being with us and, you know, asking questions. And let's see. Oh, and then we have one other share uh, winner tonight. Thank you so much for sharing the live for us. Elaine Elmer. So Mary, Chris, Amber, and Elaine, please reach out to us at podcast at stanley.com and we will connect with you to get you your free product coupons. And don't forget to fill out the survey because you, if you didn't win with what I just announced, you still have a chance to win. So please fill out that survey. And everyone, Dr. Cubit, thanks for being on tonight. We always appreciate your insight and your expertise on um, a lot of these topics. And I think you answered some really good questions. Some that we haven't, I don't feel like we've really touched on. No, before, great so questions that was fantastic. tonight. Yep. Great questions. So, all right. Thank you everyone so much. We appreciate uh, you being here with us and uh, we will catch you next time.